fishing with empathy, running successful fishing campaigns without making enemies and irritating people. I, I find that pretty huge because it's very easy to make people mad. I think there was a couple in our live calls today where people are not fans of their fishing exercises. So without further ado, let me introduce Su Yun Chung. Su Yun Chung is a security analyst at EAB Global, a leading provider of technology, marketing, and research solutions for institutions of higher education. In her role at EAB, Su Yun focuses on risk management. Oh, it's time to go. Time to show up for your talk. Uh, Social engineering with a focus on conducting phishing engagements and security awareness. She is an alumni of Rutgers University and holds multiple certifications. Joining her is Brian Markham. Brian Markham is an executive hacker, advisor, and mentor who is passionate about uh, building security programs and teams. He's worked in IT and security for over 20 years and is currently the CISO at EAB Global. Without further ado, I will let Brian, take it away with Fishing with Empathy, running successful fishing campaigns without making enemies and irritating people. Good luck. Thank you. All right, what's up, Etsy community? Let's party. Standard disclaimer, while we will reference things that we did at our employer, this talk does not represent the views of our employer. Necessary. All right, so what's up? First of all, before we start, before we introduce ourselves a little bit more, I just want to th say thank you to the volunteers and sponsors and everyone that made this happen. I'm so stoked that this village happened this year, period, but I am even more stoked to be up here and uh, with all of you today. So thank you so much, everyone that made this happen. So yeah, so I'm, I'm a CISO, I'm a social engineer, I'm, I'm old. Um, and you can fish me with, uh, with sneakers. Sion, you wanna? This one. Hi everyone, I'm Sion. I'm so happy to be here. Um, if you wanna fish me, use vintage art prints and just FYI, it's my first time here and I'm also presenting, so very excited today. <laughs> All right, so let's just talk why Sion and I uh, are here today and what we wanna talk about. I think how many here do fishing simulations, right? How many people have had really, are there kids here? How many people have had really weird shit happen during your fishing simulations? All right. So we're here giving this talk because we've been doing fishing simulations and we were just astounded by the amount of weird stuff that happened during our fishing simulations. When the light bulb really came on for me was this fishing sim that we did where we offered our colleagues, our employees of our company. A holiday gift and they would get to choose which holiday gift they they got now of course you had the people that were like mad that they didn't get their patagonia jacket but what one of the people did was they got on the phone and called the ceo of the company that we impersonated and i was like all right i definitely did not expect that to happen so after like five or six phone calls with that ceo we finally like smoothed things over and i was like i never want to do that again and so i have to like rethink how we do pretext development and what potential consequences could be. But really, this is why what we do gets a bad reputation because things like this happen and it makes people feel bad. It makes people feel like victims, like we've deceived them uh, and they feel like something legitimately bad has happened. We think there's a way that you can do fishing simulations without what really just like controlling the blast radius. And that's what we wanna talk about today. So we have to like, just like, let's go back to like the beginning and like, why are we even doing fishing? Like, yeah, it's fun, but like, that's not really why we're doing it. We're really doing it because we want to learn about our employee community. Uh, we want to test hypotheses. We want to fuzz test these humans, gauge how well our training and communication works, right? This is why crazy stuff happens. Like fuzzing an app, weird stuff's going to happen. Fuzzing people, weird stuff is going to happen. So with this information in hand, with these goals in mind, um, when we learn about these things, we can figure out how we're going to get better at, uh, at being a, a defense against phishing attacks. Not perfect, but better. That's all we want to do. We want to get better over time. So a good way to think about this is really defining your object of measure. So many people get hung up on the click rates. What direction is my click rate going? There are so many other ways that you can measure success here. Some quantitative, some qualitative. These are just some of the ones that we've come up with. How do people respond to a suspicious message? Are they doing it the way that they should, that you want them to be doing it? Do they even know that you exist? Do they even know that they have either a report phishing button or that there's an email that they can send to? We literally had someone forward it to the CEO 
It's like, why would you do that? He's not going to do anything, right? Like, so just figuring that out and realizing that people do that, you can adjust your communications and training to make sure that they do the right thing. We'll talk more about that in a minute. How long does it take for them to report it? How many people take the bait, but report anyway? So Yun's going to talk a little bit more about that. Who sets their out of office message to go to anyone? That's also something that we like to see because that's something that we can talk, we can uh, stress more when we do our training. Uh, does a warning banner impact click and report rates? This is how we tested whether or not to put a warning banner on external messages. We actually tested to see if the, if the click rates were higher or lower, if with, with or without the banner. And we actually saw that the rates were lower with the banner, so we decided to implement it. So here's like a really good example. Um, so we, uh, we saw that employees were reporting phishing to IT security, CEO, head of IT, their supervisor, like I said, the CEO of the impersonated company. So our conclusion was our communications sucked and they were ineffective. We needed to be better at that. So our plan, improve communications, reinforce the best reporting method, make sure that it's in all of our training, make sure we remind people all the time. And what happened in the next test, the majority of reports came in through the report phishing button, which is what we wanted people to do. So when we saw this, we were like, this actually worked. Like we actually changed behavior without being jerks to people, without like telling them you have to do this, or if you don't do this, you have to have a conversation with HR. No one likes that, right? And, and this is like some of the reasons why we don't wanna run phishing simulations. This is why it gets a bad reputation. People can feel like garbage because we penalize them up and including termination. I talked to someone this week at this conference that literally saw someone get fired from the company because they clicked on too many phishing emails. We do not wanna do that to people. We don't have to do that to people to be good at this. Uh, or to get better against phishing or to learn about our user community. Um, we don't want to single out poor performers with additional training or chats with HR. That again, makes people feel bad. That makes security less accessible for them. Best case scenario, we're building a community of engaged people. They're never going to be experts like we are, but we want them to know at least where to go to and that they know that they can come to us even with something that they think is silly and that will help them and that we won't judge them. I literally had a woman cancel her credit card because she clicked on a phishing email. And I have no idea how she came to that conclusion. Like, it, it, like maybe she thought her computer was going to blow up or it was like a Mr. Robot situation, but she literally canceled her credit card. And I was like, holy shit, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want that to happen. So we don't want things like that to happen when I reduce the blast radius. So we don't want to do public sh shaming, something equivalent to like a corporate wall of sheep. We don't want that. Um, we do also do not want to be dunking on our colleagues, like testing out our awesome APT style pretext, like for the red teamers here. You know, that's your domain. You guys rock on and do your thing. But for us doing internal sims, we really don't need to do that. I have this like kind of saying that I stole from someone called try easier. I'm going to talk about that a little bit when we talk about pretext development. I think we can all afford to try a little bit easier with our pretext development. So let's look at what happens when pretext development goes completely off the rails. Um, so this was a tweet that got sent out back in the spring. Uh, this company did a... Uh, phishing campaign that offered their employees a $7,500 stipend because times were tough with COVID. This was obviously horrible. It made people feel horrible. People hurting in the economy actually thought they were going to get $7,500. So they clicked to learn more only to find out like, surprise, this actually wasn't real. The joke's on you. Um, so this got picked up by the union and they actually wrote a blog post about it. And I pulled this quote out of the blog post, which I think I, I couldn't say it any better and I'll read it. While this was certainly an effective way for OHSU to run this test, one does have to wonder if waging psychological warfare on your own employees is the best way to educate them on cybersecurity. I don't want to get blown up like that, like, right? I don't think any of us do, right? So like I said, we want to try easier. We want to use everyday corporate asks rather than these elaborate pretexts. We don't have to get crazy with, with these pretexts to get the results that we want, to get the data that we want. So why are we doing it? We don't need to flex, right? All we need is the data. All we want is the outcome. We never want to use fear, threats, or intimidation. We have to look our colleagues in the eye. We have to work with them on other initiatives. You don't want to walk into a meeting and them say, there's that a-hole that sends me those emails and then sends me mandatory training when I do the wrong thing. You're not going to get things done as a security team if that's the way people view you. You don't need to offer a gift or a prize. Most people will just click on stuff anyway, to be quite honest with you. Like, I, I mean, it, that person that really wanted the Patagonia jacket, I thought seriously about buying it for him because I felt really bad. But really, all you need to do is be like, oh, hey, there's mandatory, uh, there's mandatory diversity training, click here. Or, you, oh, you forgot to record your community service hours, click here. That's usually good enough. And if you put 
you know, obviously we want to test, so we want to have some hard tests and some easy tests, but if you're developing the pretext right, you can make these everyday corporate asks actually look very attractive to the employee. And also you want to consider the source, right? Now the rule, the, the lesson that I learned from that situation with the CEO is that I don't want to impersonate someone that I want to have to talk to after the fact and explain why did I do that without talking to them, right? So we have a rule now. When we impersonate someone, we talk to them about it first, right? And most of them feel like they're like, 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 like they're in a secret agent movie or something. Like they, like we like read them into this, this art, this like op that we were doing, right? And so they like love it, right? But, oh yeah. Um, so they like love it and you're getting them involved and then they're more aware of what's going on and what you're doing too. So that can be kind of fun to like work with some non-technical people, people in HR, like, Hey, we're going to impersonate you. You might get some weird emails, just forward them to us. Right. Or you can say, you know what? I di actually didn't send that. You better talk to InfoSec. Right. Like, so we kind of switch it up, but we get them involved and most of the time they enjoy it. This was one that we sent, like just an example, like complete mandatory community service training, some tells here. Or the fact that we use a like a, 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 a domain eab1.com instead of our regular domain. This person doesn't even exist. We just made them up. Um, so, because we want people to like actually think about this stuff. Like, have you ever talked to a guy named Don before in talent? No, because he doesn't exist, right? So we want people to be thinking critically about what they're doing. And Suyun will show you in, in a moment, like kind of how we do, uh, like how we debrief uh, our people on, uh, on these phishing tests once we've done them. So. Let's cook that fish. Okay. Yes. Um, so before we get started, just a couple of things that I want to talk about. So um, our whole campaign setup, our tool selection and everything kind of involved in the process is based on the following objectives. So we want to be uh, doing this in, oh no, you can't hear. Oh, sorry. Better? Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. So <laughs> that's objectives that we want to keep in mind is we want to do this low cost. So how can you do this in the most low cost effective way? Um, how can you do this in a very cheap way without, you know, being called a cheapskate, you know? Um, also it's about efficiency. How, how can you get the most value out of it? And also it's about creating a positive and meaningful experience. So it's about you understanding and learning about your company culture and security behavior, but it's about you creating and kind of creating this positive learning experience for your employees. So they go and think, oh, I did something wrong. How do I do better? How do I do better for my company and kind of um, improve my own security behavior? You want your employees to be thinking like this. So the whole not irritating um, emphasis and component about our whole um, presentation is about you not irritating yourself by following these objectives and not burning yourself out by doing something really expensive and time consuming and laborious. But it's also about um, not irritating your stakeholders because you need that continual buy-in from them to be able to do your phishing engagement. And also it's not about not irritating your target because you want this to be, as I said, a positive learning and meaningful experience for your employees at the end of the day. So let's talk about tool selection. So the tools and gear uh, here is your email setup and your phishing toolkit. So for email setup, Gmail, free, very easy to do. And people might think Gmail, like that's so easy. That's a stupid domain. People are gonna catch that. But trust me when I say people fall, fall for the shit like all the time, because in my, uh, the pretext that I create, it's something about new hire. And I use a, like a, like a name, like Suyan Chung at like gmail.com. People open that email, they click it and they respond to it asking, Hey, I can't open this uh, link, resend it to me. So Gmail works, but if you want to, you know, own your own domain, get a little creative, you can definitely do that um, through AWS and you just hook it up to AWS workmail. Very easy to do um, for phishing toolkit. I use, and I do recommend GoFish. It's a open source tool and it's really easy to set up. And the instructions are basically very uh, crystal clear. So that's our uh, tools selection. Now, that's not how it's been, okay. Okay. 
Um, so about your target selection. So your uh, target selection is dependent on whether you want to spray or you want to spear fish. So the pro in spraying is that you get a little bit of everybody in your company. The con is you have to be cognizant of your sample size because if you are not and your sample size gets really big um, during the analysis and reporting phase, you're going to be bombarded with so much raw data. It's going to drain you, it's going to burn you out. So it's just something for you to be mindful of. Um, the pro in spearfishing, well, kind of a con, um, is that you kind of only get like a view, a tunnel view of the specific function or department that you're testing, but you actually get a really detailed um, view and understanding of that specific function. So the popular departments that we normally go for are finance, um, marketing and sales, marketing and sales specifically, because they are external facing, so they're facing with a lot of emails from the outside, including phishing emails. Um, for me, my favorite is new hires, um, also because I do new hire security orientation. So yeah, um, so I kind of like sow the seed of like an impending test. I talk about a lot of security controls that we have in place, including email security controls. So it's a good way for me to kind of gauge that they comprehend everything that I just spewed at them in that moment. Like, is there something that I should be doing more if our results come out a little bit shitty? Um, so that's your target selection. So you have your um, tool setup, domain setup. You have your targets identified. Now it's about setting the campaign and again through GoFish. So why is that not showing up? Okay. So you first have to set up your sending profile, landing page, email template, and user group list before you can create and schedule your new campaign. You have to do, do these correctly and you have to do them um, fully. Um, in terms of landing page, the needful, the bare minimum is a 404 error because you just essentially just want them to click. And the more you do actually, um, the more your employees might feel like you're there being deceited. So if you like create a page saying like, hey, give me your card information, give me your name, your phone number, address, things like that. At the end of the day, you might get a more of a more of that irritation, that kind of negative attitude from your employees. So all you need is a cl clicking rate. That's the bare minimum. You don't want to overcomplicate the work for yourself either. So there's that. So once everything's set up and then you're about to kick off the campaign, something just like a little advice for you is that you should close out your campaign kind of end of day because there is no point in you dragging it out for days and days. You're not going to see a significant spike in the reporting or clicking rate. So it's best that you just close it out end of day and start doing your reporting and analysis phase of it all. Okay. So before you send out the fish, there are a couple of pre-engagement activities that you have to address. Um, and first and foremost, you should inform your stakeholders. And this is important if you want that um, continual buy-in. Um, and also we do inform our IT because we don't want them to handle responses. And also our objective is not to uh, test IT. You should send test emails and you can do this through GoFish. And you want to do this because if you have multiple um, email security controls in place, I mean, kudos to you, you are doing the right things, but likely your email, your phishing emails are going to uh, be quarantined by whatever mechanisms you're using. So just make sure that you whitelist your domain. And if your email has a link that you know is going to be blocked by, say, safe link, just go to the default safe link um, policy and just modify that and then uh, revert it back when your campaign is over. And finally, just ensure that the appropriate ports are open. So like on top of my head, port um, 80 and 443. Keep them open and then do whatever you need to do after the campaign is over and edit all of this, test it out as much as you need before you kick it off because you want to be able to do this right. You want your targets to be getting the phishing email at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so you kick it off and then like what he's doing, your targets are going to be eating up the fish, you know, numbing and munching and all that stuff. Um, they're going to be eating that up. And at the end of the day, you close that campaign. And there are also some post engagement activities that you have to address. And one of the most important thing is you should send out the follow-up emails to your targets. And you just have to be mindful of the tone of that email. You want it to be encouraging. You don't want it to be punitive. Um, you don't want to place blame on them. You don't want to do anything that will like foster any kind of negative attitude. This is all like a learning aspect. So you really should stress, uh, stress the learning aspect of this all 
And you should really emphasize the intent, your mission in doing this exercise. You should also kind of remind them on how to report their, uh, report any suspicious emails, your reporting mechanisms. Um, and if you want to further promote um, the learning, your employee learning, infographics help a lot. So this is an example of something that I created. Um, so I impersonated um, this uh, person, Casey, at our company. It's a new hire training. As you notice, it's Gmail. It worked. So again, Gmail works fine. Um, and I just like highlight the tail, uh, tail signs and um, the common red flags that you notice in phishing emails like urgency. And I just send that out so that it can kind of gauge that and like when they actually encounter real phishing examples, uh, phishing emails in the future, they know what warnings and signs to look for. So after all this, you're about 60% done. Now you have to go to the analysis and reporting phase. So when you go to GoFish, you're going to pull up the raw data. It's going to look daunting, but good news, you only have to focus on the identifier, which is your email. I uh, redacted that for, you know, security purposes. Um, and the action. So under the message column, you see a click link and emailed open. And you also want to focus on the IP addresses and the payload. The IP addresses are important because it tells you whether um, the action that was taken, so the clicked link or emailed open, was done by an actual person or by an automated ISP, so automated activity. And I don't know about you, but I don't know all the IPs out there in the world. I'm not, I'm not an encyclopedia, so I need to look them up too. Um, so the tools that I utilize are MaxMind. So that is a free tool. There's a 25 um, limit, like 25 query limit. Um, but if you are not, if your target size is small and you're not really, you don't really need to look, that, look things up, MaxMind is the way to go. But for me, I have a lot of targets that I have to go through, IP addresses that I have to go through. So I rely on info, uh, ipinfo.io, which is a little bit of a subscription fee, but it's not a lot. Um, and they're both very useful. So they bring it up to you to decide what you want to use. But anyways, so if once you have an IP address that you kind of want to confirm if it's by a real person or by an automated um, ISP, you plug that IP in one of these IP lookup tools and you'll get something that looks like that. So on the left, you see the IP address. On the right, you see the, um, the ISP. It identifies the ISP. So things like Colo Crossing, Amazon.com, Palo Alto, Trustware, they're all automated ISP. So you know that when you go back, you identify that ISP, you know that action, whatever action that was taken, it's not legitimate as in like it wasn't done by a real person. So you can kind of hide that and not include that in your uh, report. But if it's coming from things like AT&T, um, Verizon, Comcast, or the IP address of your own VPN, you know that that's done by an actual person so if you identify that in your data, um, you know that's done by a real person and that's something you should include in your report. So that compiled data uh, plus the data that you, pour, uh, that you pull from your reporting um, platform mechanism, you use that both together to create a report that looks like this with the following categories. So we want to optimize reporting rate um, and no click. So obviously we really, really pay attention to the didn't click and report it rate, but we, we also focus on the circled one, the click and report it uh, rate, because that told your company to use, or are they emailing information security inbox, or are they uh, directly messaging you? And if it's kind of like spread evenly across, maybe you want to go back to your company and say, hey guys, use that uh, report phishing button, or hey guys, use this function, because this is what we use for our company. Um, who responded to the sender? So who actually took a step further, clicked and responded to your email and said things like, hey, can open the email um, or can open the link, resend it to me again. Because these people, not only they clicked it, they took a step further and they opened the email. And so there is some kind of risk involved in that. You just want to make sure and keep a close uh, eye on that population and make sure that they are you know, understanding kind of the risk associated with this behavior. Um, how quick was the report? Who, how quick was the first uh, report that came in through your um, reporting mechanism? And again, who clicked and reported? This is important again, because it tells you how much your function is being, is trusted. And finally, were there any mentions in public forums? So like in Slack or any other direct messaging platform, because this tells us who is being vigilant and how they are being vigilant. And this is all important for us to 
um, gauge and kind of see how we can reshape and improve our security program. Ooh, I'm out of time. So with that, I'm giving it back to Brian, who is going to tie it in a nice bow and summarize everything. I'm taking it home because we're at time. So if there's one thing that y'all remember when you walk out of here, it's that you can do this. It's possible to run phishing campaigns without making enemies and irritating people. It requires careful planning. It requires a lot of empathy. Uh, we got to get out of this mindset that people need to be punished. That's not how people learn. People can learn through empathy. You're their, you're their best friend. You're their expert. You literally exist for them. So, and you don't have to spend a lot of money. You don't have to set up a lot of stuff. Uh, we set up AWS Workmail in like under five minutes with a custom domain. It's super easy. Quantitative and qualitative results matter. Um, but really what you want is to build an active, engaged community that will actually like you. And I know that everyone here can do it. So thank you so much for the time today. I know that we're at time. It's so awesome to see like eyes and people in person. And we're just very grateful to be here. Enjoy the rest of the con. Thank you.